So they probably all know that I was asked here on behalf of the yes. Forensic Nursing Program. And I was very happy to accept the invitation. My name is Anne Marie Myers. And I was happy to accept the invitation because I've worked with forensic nurses in emergency response. And I'm going to share a little bit uh, with you today about what different specialists can bring to multiple fatality identification and the forensic context. But I'm going to start with talking about forensic anthropology, which is my field, and some of the more tradition, traditional aspects of anthropology or archaeology that you might be familiar with, which is, you know, the ancient materials, Egypt, mummies, that kind of thing, and then bring you into the forensic context. Okay, so I'm pretty, uh, <clears throat> pretty relaxed as long as everything works. And uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. We have a, a two-hour window, and I'll try to talk for just about an hour and a half and leave time. Uh-oh. <clears throat> As I mentioned, forensic, <clears throat> we are flooded with forensic images and forensic media and forensic uh, entertainment uh, on television and other sources. And most of our information about archaeology comes more from the health and sciences aspect, the ancient remains. And of course, that's how I first got interested in all of this, is my mother and father uh, had nine kids, and they read to us in the car to keep us busy and occupied. Uh, and my mother read King Tut, The Secrets of Tutankhamun's uh, Tomb. And so I became really interested in archaeology and pursued it. Um, but as luck and the economy would have it, I wasn't able to find work in my field of archaeology, and bones was my field of study. And so uh, after I finished my master's degree back in 1982, I um, basically introduced myself to a forensic anthropologist who worked at Louisiana State University. And he said, well, I could use some help. He was a fresh PhD starting a program, setting up a program. But he also did consultation with the police departments and looked at people that were beyond recognition. He said, you know, would you be interested in being my lab assistant, training the graduate students, um, and also doing the service? And I was like, mm, I don't know. It wasn't the kind of household wor word that it is today, right? So. I called my major professor back in Arkansas and said, what's this forensic stuff? I don't know if I can do that. And he goes, well, it's not really for everybody because you're looking at modern remains, sometimes very fresh. And I said, well, I'll give it a try. I was starving at the time, and the economy had changed. Barbara and I were just speaking about uh, programs being cut. And when Reagan came in uh, to power um, back in 82, so much of the money that was sent for cultural resource management or the preservation of old archaeological, historical, prehistoric materials was cut off. 75% of the jobs in my field that I just graduated with a master's degree with were gone, just gone. So that was the impetus to go visit this forensic anthropologist. He hired me. I started doing forensics. And I did it for three years from 1982 to 1985. So I learned the trade, the business. And when I came up to Massachusetts, because I decided I didn't want to work for somebody else for the rest of my life, I really wanted to be in charge, or at least get a PhD and see what would happen after that. And I came to Massachusetts back to New England uh, because I had a family member that was sick and wanted to, I had enough of the South. So I moved back up here and pursued a doctorate in anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And within the first week, we were contacted by the medical examiner's office to identify some unknown skeletonized remains. And uh, my professor, my major professor there said, sure, she'll do it. And I said, well, not for free. It's a service, just like forensic nursing is a service, forensic anthropology is a service. And so I set up a consulting service and worked for 11 years as a consultant to the medical examiner's office. In 96, I then um, became a full-time employee in Boston and worked full-time uh, at the medical examiner's office as a forensic anthropologist. 
So by 96, the landscape is changing. Forensics becomes much more ubiquitous, and there's more of a national attention to get the right specialist in to assist. The medical examiner system is becoming more diverse, and the specialists are necessary. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I'll wrap it all together. But I first want to introduce you to my uh, my favorite mummy. Let's see. Um, maybe if I use the, usually there's an icon, there we go. Let me try this. Is that going in that direction? Yeah, Let's go going backwards. Here. Yeah, there we there. go. I'll keep it on there. And then maybe, let's see. Yeah, now it should work. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just, this one? Yep, yeah, back. And okay, I was doing page down. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, anthropology is really aimed at trying to understand cultural and social practices. And the study of archaeology basically takes us into the past through the material remains that are left here to try to reconstruct and explain what happened in the past. So we're really looking for who, what, when, and, the, when and where, right? The, con the contextual data. So here's my favorite mummy. Anybody heard Vatsi, the Iceman? Not your typical Iceman, like Mafia guy, but Iceman in terms of, he was in the glacier, okay? And he's an archeological find, okay? He dates back a couple thousand years, and these are some of the artifacts that were with him in the glacier, and now with global warming, some of the glaciers are receding, so he was uncovered, and he was in an area in the Alps uh, between two countries, so they kind of passed him back and forth. Nobody really wanted to take responsibility with him, with, for him. And so eventually they did, uh, the uh, French government, and he was put through a series of x-rays, okay? 3D CAT scans, some pretty high-tech high materials. And what was interesting about Otzi, they were just trying to find out. Now, anthropologists and archaeologists will study mummified remains, they'll take samples, they can see what the person, their last meal was, they study the copper lights or the feces, and they can find a lot about diet, diseases they had, it's amazing, the technology that can be applied to these. Well, in their study, they actually found out that Otzi, after putting him through three-dimensional three scanning, was a murder victim. He'd been murdered. And he had gone up this passage through the mountains and had actually been died of exposure and then also the blood that he lost from the wound that he received. Okay, so he had a big spear point in his back. So he ended up being a forensic case. The statute of limitations has probably expired on his murder. I think we'd have a hard time, uh, you know, tracking down the killer. But what was just an archaeological find then became kind of a forensic interest. And it shows you just how far the technology has come. With the mummified remains especially, we can put these through, through 3D CAT scans, three-dimensional CAT scans, and literally do a visual survey of the body without doing any cutting. It's called virtutopsy, okay? And it's being used in the medical fields um, for medical investigation. So archaeology has bumped up against the forensic context in a number of different situations. Forensic is basically anything that we can use in a court of law, right? It's anything that we're going to bring into a medical legal investigation as it concerns a suspicious, unusual, or sudden death. So it becomes sort of academic with Otzi, what, you know, what we find out about him. It becomes intriguing and interesting. But the forensic applications that we use all the different sciences for are not just academic, right? They're concerned with people that die under suspicious and unusual circumstances. And we have the medical examiner's office who does 
who conducts the medical investigation of sudden, suspicious, and unusual deaths. So the forensic anthropologist, like many other forensic specialists, finds themselves interfaced with the public arena. So they come out of academic disciplines and essentially have to interface from their particular field, just like nursing interfaces into a forensic field for the, through the forensic nursing, by applying the methods and techniques of that particular field. So as an anthropologist, my specialty is biological anthropology, or the study of the skeleton, and the skeleton as a roadmap of how that person lived and how that person died. Okay? So I have the advantage of the show bones, and I can just say, you know what bone anthropologists do? Forensic anthropologists specifically are like Temperance Brennan on the show bones. Okay? I don't have all the money and all the fancy equipment and all the assistance that she has, but you get the general idea. The skeleton is a vehicle through which the anthropologist can literally drive through the person's life. They can tell whether they took care of their teeth, whether they had a root canal, whether they had broken bones, whether they were well nourished, if they had children, okay? So there are lots of indications of all the bumps and bruises and life experiences that we have that get registered on the skeleton. There are also many things that don't get registered on the skeleton, okay? So the anthropologist is an assistant or a specialist that contributes to casework in modern forensic cases. The medical examiner is going to do the autopsy. They're going to do the examination of the soft tissue. But when the soft tissue is gone, it's either completely decomposed, it's disfigured in some way, maybe by fire or intentional mutilation of the material, the remains, or it's so decomposed that it's skeletal. It's beyond recognition. We can't look at the person and say, that's George, okay? So in that case, specialists, especially the forensic anthropologist, can become involved with the medical examiner's office. And I worked for the medical examiner's office here uh, for about 24 years, my affiliation. I was a consultant to them for 11 years, and then, as I said, I was a full-time uh, employee. What was fascinating to me was I'm also a trained archaeologist. So part of my specialty is that I look at skeletons, but I also know how to dig them up and preserve the context within which they arise from. So this was perfect for forensic anthropology and working at the medical examiner's office because many people are not found right away and they have to be recovered from the environments in which they're found. So um, a litany of cases that I've worked on includes the Molly Bish case, right? missing lifeguard out of uh, Warren, Massachusetts, and her, she was abducted from her post at Cummings Pond. She was missing for three years. She was found, uh, her bathing suit was found three years after her abduction, and it took us three weeks to recover her remains because they were scattered over a 35-acre area. So archaeology is absolutely essential to document analyze and identify the remains. Archaeology is really an important part because archaeologists are trying to reconstruct what happened. They're trying to get to the who, what, when, where from the context. It ends up that archaeology is very helpful for law enforcement because law enforcement is really geared towards crime prevention. Right? They're not really trained in all of the arts and disciplines that support it. So it's really the specialists that come to it. So I've also recovered people from the Quincy Quarry, 170 feet down into the Quincy Quarry, um, all over Massachusetts in all sorts of difference, in the bo bottom of a freighter, all sorts of different environments, okay? So it's wherever people end up, and the criteria is that they're beyond recognition, okay? So the anthropologist studies skeletonized remains. We look at human variation. And we're able to reconstruct from that the age, the sex, the history, their ancestry, instead of using the term race, the ancestry of those ind individuals, what their population stock is, where they come from. 
and how tall they are, what medical and dental anomalies they might have, how long they've been out there, and basically cause of death. At least we try to figure out how they died. Okay? So we have comparative materials that we can work with. And so we apply this information to a crime scene where considerable time has passed. And the important part, again, is the recovery, because if we recover it properly, we can gain a lot of information about who that person is and what happened to them. If we're cavalier in that part of it, we can destroy evidence. So this individual presents a very interesting death scene, okay? What can you tell me just by the observations? What can you see in this? Face down. She's face down, okay? I just told you it was a woman, but it's face, the person is face down, okay? What else? I think on. That's all this person had on, okay? So there is no clothing, okay? And there are socks, okay? What else? Yes. And the neck. Okay. So from the archaeological context, we're seeing something that might be related to the cause of death. We don't know that for sure. We don't want to jump to any conclusions, but we're carefully looking at it. All this fiber here, this is, this is a shot where the fiber has, most of it has been removed. But this was covered with all this white fiber. I do want to venture a guess what that might have been. White fuzzy blanket, a rug. Okay, you know those rugs, you put them through a mesh, the mesh disintegrates and you just have all the fibers. Okay, anything else? What about the where she's laying. It's dug, in. dug in, okay? But it's not very deep. Would you be surprised if I told you that the socks were ground at the surface? She was literally no more than three inches below the ground surface. This woman was deposited for 16 years across the street from where she went missing. No one had any idea she was literally across the street buried in a neighbor's yard, okay? The information came to light because someone was pinched uh, on a drug charge. He said he wanted to talk to the DA because he knew where a body was buried. He gave the DA some information. We show up to dig the person up. We bring cadaver dogs in there. They laid right down on, on the grass because literally she was so close to the surface. Once I got it back, so we were very careful in the excavation. I, you can see I have rulers laid out so I can document exactly where she is, right, in space, horizontally and vertically in space, okay? And I also use a shop vac to gather up all those, th those fibers were pesky, they were everywhere. Now you can imagine a, a good size, small, you know, eight by 10 rug was used to wrap her up, okay? So we were very careful in removing that because they didn't want to damage any of the bones. It ends up that she has 11 stab wounds on her back. There were four people in an apartment, three men and, and this woman. They were all doing drugs. Two of the men left to get some more drugs and the man and the woman were left in the apartment. When the two men returned with more drugs, she was dead on the floor with 11 stab wounds on a white carpet. They all proceeded to roll her up, grab an electrical cord, wrap it around the neck and around the legs to carry her out to the backyard. So the cord had nothing to do with cause of death. I thought it did at first too, but it ended <clears throat> excuse me, it ended up that the stab wounds, which were still clearly visible <clears throat> because we were so careful not to damage the bones, and they were still engorged or darkened 
and gorged with blood. An anthropologist can tell the difference between an injury that occurs during your lifetime that heals at the time of death, when blood is, when it's still vital, and then an injury that occurs post-mortem or after the body has decomposed. And those are things that we're looking for. So a forensic case has a huge amount of information that the anthropologist then provides to the medical examiner. The medical examiner is the key personnel in the forensic medical part of the system that delivers the information through the vehicle of the death certificate. Through the autopsy and the death certificate, the medical examiner provides cause and manner of death. Okay? The anthropologist, as I said, is an assistant or a specialist that contributes their, case, their expertise. So an anthropologist can assist with body recovery, because I know archaeology and I can conduct or command the police to assist with that, a hard tissue analysis of the bones to establish who that person is, right, the profile, multiple methods of identification to figure out who that person is. So once we have a profile, then we have to do the harder work, which is matching them to missing persons records. And then trauma reconstruction. What's the mechanism of death? What's the cause? And by whose hand? The manner, right? Is it a homicide? Is it an accident? Is it a suicide? Is it natural or is it undetermined? We can't tell. The medical examiner is going to put that on the death certificate, but because their area of expertise is with the soft tissue, the anthropologists assist them and they use the information that we provide and then they go ahead and write the death certificate. Anthropologists have been around for a long time doing this kind of work in many different arenas. And uh, I'm sure maybe some of you have read about this. I mean, sometimes National Geographic covers um, the, di the disaster situation. Sometimes they cover human rights. But there are many mass graves around the globe that uh, anthropologists have contributed both the forensic archaeology and the forensic anthropology. And one forensic anthropologist um, who's written a book called The Bone Woman, if any of you are interested in that, her name is Clea Koff, is featured here. And here they're conducting an excavation of a mass grave. And it doesn't matter whether I'm looking at one individual through the medical examiner's office or they're excavating 2,000 individuals in a mass grave. And this kind of work has been going on since the 60s and 70s. Wherever there's political unrest, there are usually regi regimes that knock out whole sectors of the population, put them in mass graves, <clears throat> as in Nazi Germany. And later, when that regime is overturned, you have a more sympathetic political environment for the excavation of those remains. And there are groups, the physicians, um, for human rights, our trained medical examiners, forensic anthropologists, and other forensic specialists that go and do this kind of work across the globe. And you can see on the back how it says UN. And this is <coughs> some of the mass grave, and they're covering it to preserve it while they're excavating. But you can see down in the lower part of the picture a skull with a execution style gunshot wound, okay? And this, this entire hill is actually human remains they're doing. She and I have been in the um, field about the same amount of time. Her entire career has been doing this. I find this a very difficult arena. I would never work. Um, I would find it very hard to work in this kind of environment. You're working on just such a huge volume. There are armed guards behind you, and then behind that are all the families. They don't really have, in the countries that they're working in, <coughs> Argentina, Bolivia, uh, Czechoslovakia, 
Sarajevo, all these different places don't have the same infrastructure that we do in terms of a forensic system. So it's very difficult once the remains are excavated to then get them ID'd, right? They don't have DNA data banks. They don't have dental records, right? Many of these people haven't been to doctors. So here she is doing her trade with another anthropologist. <clears throat> They're laying out the individual skeletons in semi-anatomical position, just as if they were a person on an autopsy table. And they're looking at indications to tell them how old the person is, what sex they are, what their ancestry is, how long they've been uh, out there, and then the cause of death. And then these are the makeshift camps that are set up to try to identify the personal property and belongings that are associated with the individual, sometimes this is the only way identifications are made. As I said, they don't have access to expensive DNA techniques or um, dental records or medical records to do a correspondence. So the families will go through and look at the clothing and the jewelry and anything else that might have been associated. So they tag everything and mark it and associate it with that particular skeleton so that they can then cross-reference it because that's probably, in many cases, the, the statistics are really quite startling. There have been um, <clears throat> 10,000 people excavated from mass graves in one section of the Czech Republic. Okay, pretty large area, but still. And there have only been maybe 200 identified out of 10,000. So I'm, I'm, I'm also just trying to show you the comparative framework that different anthropologists work in um, and different disaster situations or mass fatality situations and that this work has been going on for quite some time. And it has been, um, wasn't aided by technology. Now with the technology that we have and some resources that are being put to it, they are trying to set up DNA capture sites so that they can actually capture the DNA just like we would for a crime scene. Um, we would capture the DNA from the family to compare it to a missing person. They're trying to do that now and there has been some money and some resources uh, that were certainly spent under the Bush administration and I'm not sure whether that will continue. So we have the <coughs> mass grave situation. <coughs> and we also have the terrorism and disaster landscape. Okay? And this has touched much closer to home uh, with 9-11 and uh, the Oklahoma City bombing and different um, air crashes. And this has highlighted for all of the specialists that work in the forensic context, the need for proper you know, documentation, recovery, identification techniques within this, because these are all essentially prosecutable crimes. And as we know from 9-11, that was a huge crime scene. Right? That was a terrorist act. That was a, an act of mass homicide. Right? And so we have to have in place the mechanisms that we use every day on a small scale and apply them to these large scale situations. And as I mentioned, this type of work has been going on for 50 to 60 years. This publication came out in the late 50s, okay? And it's by anthropologists that looked at the Korean War dead and many other individuals that died in armed conflict that were brought through the medical identification system, okay, through the U.S. Army. And this is, this is a standard textbook in my field because this is where a lot of meth methods and techniques actually got developed on the war dead because they were able to use them to look at the material and develop some comparative study techniques and then return the material, photograph it, document it, and then return it to the loved ones, to the individuals before they were buried. 
So they developed some standards actually on the Korean War dead uh, during that conflict on young males that were killed in, in combat. So this serves as a training manual for many of us. So if we move into the present time, we're, we're just hopefully learning from past mistakes, adding technology to these protocols that have been set up um, actually 50 to 60 years ago. Not much has changed in the disaster landscape. The magnitude of the disaster, the terrorist event, the multiple t fatality has increased. But I was in um, Chicago a couple of years ago uh, for the uh, Academy of Forensic Science meetings and the theme was disasters and identification and recovery. And they had all sorts of papers on all of these historical disasters. And one of them was a ferry disaster in where a ferry came, was coming across the lake in Chicago and a huge, there were 800 people on the ferry. You know, it was a huge disaster. And it, it was about 18, I want to say about 1898 right around the turn of the century. And it's amazing to me, you know, and you, I mean, you can sit down, there's a whole literature on disasters that have been happening, you know, globally for hundreds of years that have been documented in writings and things like that. And it's amazing that the fatality counts. The difference is that we're putting a lot of time, energy, and technology into trying to identify those individuals and return them to their loved ones. And the forensic nurses have a large part of this. And, and so do the other forensic specialists uh, in terms of crime scene processing and in terms of human remains identification. So I put some of the, these are, this is a map of some of, this is a mass grave site. New Orleans, we know Katrina, okay, a natural disaster. New York City. World Trade Center and West Warwick, Rhode Island for the Station Nightclub, which I'm going to talk about. The common thread that kept repeating itself through the early aftermath of 9-11 is that many of these large-scale scenes were not treated as archaeological sites. Okay? And what do I mean by that? <coughs> the magnitude was so great that the life-saving efforts and the emergency response was, and rightfully so, geared towards recovery, life-saving techniques, and then recovery of those individuals that were deceased, but to also clear the scene, right? 9-11, we watched on television for a year them with trucks taking debris out of ground zero. You remember that? And, the, and at the end of that moment, it was literally a year to the day almost, they, they were able to say that that site was now ready for its recovery, okay? In that process, it was never really documented as a crime scene, okay? This, um, uh, Worcester, Worcester fire, 1999. Remember that? There were six firemen that died, and I forget the name of the warehouse, but very large scene, six-story warehouse, collapsed down onto itself. Very often at these scenes, fire, and as we know at 9-11, we had two stations go in for immediate response, for life-saving response, to put out the fire. They did the same thing at 9-11. They went in, and those individuals were trapped in between the buildings. Those were the only people that were recovered complete or near complete. The rest of the individuals at the World Trade Center were pulverized from the buildings collapsing. They were designed to telescope down onto themselves, and the, the pressure of that event literally pulverized all mechanical equipment, all human remains, okay? There, if you read the accounts or talk to people who were down there as the first responders, I had a friend who was a dog handler and she went down with her search and rescue dog to try to find individuals that were hopefully trapped in the building that were still alive. 
And she said it was the weirdest thing. There was, there was nothing. There was this cloud, remember? There was this huge cloud. And it was all the pulverized, atomized material. Okay? There was material in there. But after a full year, they removed all the material. They took it out to the Fresh Kills dump. And they sifted it. Anthropologists were out there sifting through all this debris. Okay? They then put it up for DNA analysis. At the end of a three-year period, they only can account for 1,400 of the 2,800 people that were there. Okay? What happened to the rest of the people? Were they all pulverized? Was something missed? Possibility. The archaeologists started looking at the possibility that in their effort to recover the material, they didn't properly excavate. Dick Gould is an archaeologist who started a group called Forensic Archaeological Recovery, and he started it right after 9-11. He went down with a group of students, trained archaeologists, to 9-11. He went down to the World Trade Center. He offered his services at the medical examiner's office. And he said, this was October 11th, so he's literally there a month later. He said, there are human remains. I would like to go down and see if there are human remains away from the footprint. Okay? Because we have two planes making impact and then the buildings collapsing. In any explosion, you have a plume. Okay? And what they found is that there were fragments of human remains on the rooftops. Does anybody remember Deutsche Bank? Okay? Deutsche Bank was right across the, the, the block from the World Trade Center. Okay? The pilot and one of the stewardesses were recovered. Okay, the whole front of the Deutsche Bank was blown out. There was a midsection taken out of the building. There, excuse me, their remains were found on one of the floors. Okay? What we found out in hindsight is when they built the road to go down to recover all the material out of it, they actually covered human remains. Potentially, there was a plume in the explosion of over a mile in all directions. Three years after 9-11, human remains were found one mile associated with the World Trade Center, one mile from ground zero. One mile in a city landscape. I don't know how many blocks that translates into. This group in October of 2001 for, foresaw the need for people to go out and recover this material. And as we all know, New York was overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed. We all were overwhelmed. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I have the benefit of hindsight. We all do. So what, what ends up happening is Dick Gould, who's a professor at Brown University, really feels that there's a need to establish a group that are trained archaeologists. We have national response teams. I'm going to talk about <coughs> NDMS, which is the National Disaster Medical System, and DMORC, which is the Disaster Mortuary Operations Response Teams. But we don't have any trained archaeologists that can go out and say, do you need our services? Let us conduct an excavation of the footprint. Let us recover information. We know it's there. Okay. So Dick ended up setting up FAR and advocating for intensive recovery at disaster sites. Up until this point, there wasn't such a thing as disaster archaeology. Okay? It was emergency response to a disaster. An emergency response by its very nature is an emergency response. You're going in, you're saving lives, 
You're getting out the people that are wounded and injured, and then you're going in and you're recovering the decedents. So essentially, his first mission was going to the World Trade Center. They did find material. They reported it to the OCME. And he then developed a nonprofit organization called FAR, and it's called Forensic Archaeological Recovery. And I suggest that we put a, a T on the end, but then we'd be a bunch of old farts, so that was next. But, you know, everybody else is a team, so we're FAR. And basically advocated for trained archaeologists conduct excavation at disaster sites. And he begins these training exercises. He and I end up hooking up, and I become the deputy director. And it wasn't until after the tragedy in Warwick happened. Okay? So interestingly, he was interested in what I did because I was working out of a medical examiner's office. He was working as a professor and an archaeologist and trying to bring it together. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, training exercises, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Warwick and the skyline. But uh, also, Dick was very instrumental in bringing this into the popular media. Okay, he's written a book on disaster archaeology, and he's advocated within certain professional organizations for the development of response teams, and he's brought it to DMORT, okay, which is the Disaster Mortuary Operations. And this is one publication where we contributed a number of forensic anthropologists and archaeologists contributed um, articles about the work that we've done in different contexts, and it's a children's magazine published Basically, it's an armature of National Geographic. It's called Dig Magazine. But they had a whole section devoted to disaster archaeology. And this is one of the sculptures that survived 9-11. And uh, I wanted to put this up to also remind people that now in this country, we have the opportunity to memorialize these large events, whether it be Warwick, Rhode Island, or the World Trade Center. And that we, this is one of the few pieces of art that survived the World Trade Center bombing. And it's being kept and memorialized um, in New York as a reminder of what happened that day. So FAR has, uh, they have several articles in this magazine, but the whole mission became training archaeologists, law enforcement, FBI, crime lab uh, individuals, anybody who wanted to get on our roster as a volunteer could then participate in training exercises and be deployed if we were called upon, okay? What ends up happening in many disaster situations is that the local resources are immediately overwhelmed, okay? Or we have an event like 9-11 that was three-pronged. We had the Pennsylvania site, we had the Pentagon, and we had New York. So, we had the state and local resources, and we had all the federal resources overwhelmed because of the magnitude of the event. If something else happened, let's say there was a flood at the time of 9-11 or a hurricane, you need local groups that will go and assist when all the other resources are overwhelmed. So Dick started to train individuals and conduct, and as I said, we started to develop a roster of individuals. Um, this is a training exercise that I um, hosted at Anna Maria College. And we were very interested in trying to intersect a lot of different issues. So it was after Hurricane Katrina. And do you remember in Houston? Houston was also hit, not just New Orleans. But they tried to transport some elderly individuals, and the bus got in an accident. I took that information, and I made a training scenario that there was a hurricane that hit the coast of Rhode Island, okay? And all the resources were overwhelmed. Anna Maria College is just sort of a 45 minute to an hour ride down to Providence, okay? We have dormitory space. So I created a scenario where Anna Maria College offered dormitory space for a hurricane center, a refugee center, evacuee center. And when the elders were transported up to campus, it was 
also raining and bad weather up there, the bus went off the road, okay? And the individuals became disoriented, developed hypothermia, went out into the woods, and expired. So our training exercise was to go find them. All the local resources were completely overwhelmed, the state resources were overwhelmed, and the federal resources. So FAR gets called in, okay? <clears throat> So here's our bus, right? And we've got some crime scene tape around it, right? The responders weren't able to get out there right away. And here I have local law enforcement. So I use the local law enforcement in Paxton. They all volunteered and they're always looking for training exercises. Why? They get money to train and they have to use it. And it's a perfect opportunity to pull in the local resources, develop a network. So here I am with my little flags. It's pretty cold out there. And we're going to do a grid search to try to locate the bodies. Okay? So I also wanted to show law enforcement the difficulty of doing a grid search in a forested area. You know, they're notorious for not using compasses, not staying in a line, right? You know? So I wanted to show them. And, and it's pretty thick. We have a nice set of, set of woods behind us, nice hiking trails, but we didn't stay on the trails. I made them all go in the woods. And here we have one of the police officers. He's found some clothing. Now, the scenario is that the individuals got hypothermic. What happens? They start taking off their clothes, right? Your body's right? It's freezing, but it's overheating. You start to take off your clothes. So we threw clothes here and there randomly, right? It's all set up. It's fun in a relative way, right? And here are one of our store, storefront dummies that we dressed up, represented an elderly individual, so they had to mark, mark it out, and then we moved on, okay? So I had to throw a red herring in there, you know, being the anthropologist, I had to throw a little monkey wrench in the works. And <clears throat> I threw a skeleton out there. Well, these elders just happened to get lost in the woods right near an old missing person, skeletonized remains, okay? It could happen, right? Meaning, when they go out there to do a grid search, you don't know what you're gonna find. You have to prepare them to find just about anything. And I'm the anthropologist, so, you know, I had to do that. So here's my skeleton, which represents a person that's been out there as opposed to a dummy. And the head is separated from the body, skeletonized. So they had to mark this. So we kept moving. And we found this. Anybody know what this is? This is a bear tree, OK? Bears will scratch and mark a tree, and as the tree grows, it'll, it'll move up, and they'll continue to mark it, okay? Why is this important? Got to be on lookout for bears, right? Here we are going to recover some elderly that have expired from hypothermia. You want to know what the risks are to the people that are out there responding, right? So photo documentation, got a little picture of it. So got to have a picture of that. Here's another dummy representing an <coughs> individual, Anna Maria College t-shirt on. Okay. So we cordon this off just like you would if it was a crime scene. We want to document it. And we were trying to also do a quick mapping exercise. One of the problems that happens at these scenes is that because the resources are tight, everybody wants to get in and get out. What we were trying to show to law enforcement is it doesn't take that long to map it. Because once you remove something from a crime scene, it's removed from the crime scene. You've destroyed the context. You need to document that. It doesn't take that long. Especially if you're a trained archaeologist and you have a transit and you can move pretty fast. So part of it is then establishing the partnerships between nonprofits and law enforcement and uh, public personnel. So here are the team of body recoverers 
okay, and they are volunteers. They are not uh, medical examiner personnel, and in a normal crime situation, it would be medical examiner personnel and law enforcement. But the scenario is written that those are overwhelmed, and so we're sending other individuals in at the behest of law enforcement and the medical examiner. So everybody knows these people are, are there. They're dressed in Tyvek. Why? This is potentially biohazardous. Okay? They haven't been dead that long, but you still want to take universal precautions. <clears throat> so archaeologists who don't normally dress in Tyvek are being asked to dress in Tyvek and still conduct their normal activities. It's a drill scenario. Okay? Okay, and here they are documenting. Okay, we've put various flags out for personal property. Okay, they're in Tyvek and gear. Everything gets documented, mapped, and photographed, and then the individual gets put into a body bag. Everybody's got garments on, and then they're brought back to the police van and then transported. Okay? The Red Cross was nice enough to come out and serve us sandwiches and hot chocolate, which is also part of the scenario. You'd have support, emergency support services from your local groups. So these kinds of training scenarios are really important. Even if they're tiny, they're, they seem somewhat pedestrian, they reinforce a number of different issues. Because the best way for us to manage any event is to be prepared. And these training exercises can be global, right? Or they can be very small. The way that the national policies are now written, actually they've always been written, but they've been reinforced recently through the National Incident Management Manuals, okay? And system, NIMS it's called, all right? The federal government since 9-11 through Homeland Security has developed an umbrella management system that we all have to participate in. Basically want any kind of disaster or incident dealt with at the local level first. So you want to train. You want to train locally and you want to reinforce that. It can always get kicked up to a higher level but it starts at the beginning. So with Disaster response, as early as 1996, way before 9-11, we have legislation that propels our role, okay, in disaster management, okay? And it's being propelled by families. Interestingly enough, the changes that took place at this time because of the first World Trade Center bombing, because of the Oklahoma City bombing, because of several terrorist-related air crashes, okay? The families were not dealt with, okay? They were put off in rooms, not told anything, asked a million questions several times over. There was an outrage, a national outcry of families about identification and about being managed at these multiple fatality sites. The families pushed for legislation. It's called the Family Assistance Act in 1996. You know, it's amazing to me that these mechanisms were in place. Federal and state agencies had to comply to address multiple fatality management under the umbrella of public safety. As is the case with any act, you have mandates, monies are released to satisfy those mandates. Money was trickled down from the federal government to the states through the executive offices of public safety. The medical examiner's office in 98, 99, and 2000 applied for grants to get our multiple fatality management act collectively together and to work with our partners. Can I have a time check? How am I doing? Five. It's five? Okay. And I'm lecturing until I started at four? Okay. All right. 
Okay. All right. I'm doing good. I'm okay. All right. <clears throat> so we got the grants, right? It was timely. It was really wonderful, really, because there was a community of people within Boston, right? We have Federal Emergency Management, FEMA, and Barbara's smiling because she was there. She was part of that community, right? We have FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. We have MEMA, Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, and we had BEMA, Boston Emergency Management Agency. We had Massport, right, the services, fire and safety services at Logan. We had the forensic nurses. We had, uh, who else did we have? Everybody. Mental health, thank you. Department of Mental Health. FBI, um, Homeland Security was, did not exist at the time. We had TSA, Transportation Safety, um, and TSB. So we had the whole alphabet soup of local, state, and federal responders. And we developed a program of interagency coordination, information technology development, and most importantly, family support, right? Family Assistance Act. What are we going to do to support the families? How are we going to manifest? How are we going to take what we know, what we've learned, and support families in multiple fatality incidences. And those were our hooks. As I tell my students, you have to have a hook. When you write a grant, you have to have a hook, right? That thing that's going to catch them. Those were the three things. So essentially, our hook was to take day-to-day -day operations at the medical examiner's office and kick them up a notch, as Emeril Lagasse would say, right? to a multiple fatality management scenario. If you don't function on a day-to-day -day level, you're not going to function when something big happens. This is all pre-9-11. So at the medical examiner's office, the normal fatality count can range from two people to 25. In one day, you can have 25 individuals that go through physical examination and or autopsy. Okay, can be that high. What if there are 400 people that come in from a terrorist event that uh, uh, sarin gas is released in Thaniel Hall? Okay? So we set about to create a series of training scenarios. Okay? 98, 99, and 2000, we were killing people left and right with all sorts of dastardly methods, right? And we would all sit down and figure out whose job was whose. Who was going to respond when? Okay? And it allowed us to prepare for logistical and operational challenges encountered in all sorts of disasters. We had field exercises, we had task force meetings because you have to have your people talk to everybody else's people, right? And then get back to the other people's people. Training seminars, incident command, fatality management, critical incidents, stress debriefing. All of these things were all new buzzwords back then. And we would literally have a tabletop exercise, right? And the tabletop exercise is you're all in a room. So OCME is over here, FBI is here, state police is there, <coughs> fire, EMS, okay? And you have a scenario. They give it to you. It's 9.05 and something happens. Who does what? And then one group stands up and says, EMS sends in people, okay? Those are tabletops. The advantage of a tabletop is that you have everybody in the same room, okay? And you have a working group for the entire day and you work through what everybody does. If it's planned correctly, the tabletop then moves to a real exercise, okay? So we've moved in the next phase to a real exercise. We're at Massport. One of the runways has been shut down. All the emergency materials are there and we have a mobile command post. This is the emergency operations center where it's all going to happen. They are going to command the incident. They're going to move everybody through it, okay? And, you know, they either bring, these are just pictures from actually a small aircraft, um, or we bring out planes, they'll bring out planes. So in this, this particular one that was in Worcester, actually at, um, H H not Hingham, the one that's in 
Yeah, Hanscom, thank you. They just brought out a plane, okay, and a car. And the plane, the scenario was the plane came down to hit a car, okay? What was the car doing on the runway? I, I can't remember. <laughs> it was part of the scenario, okay? <clears throat> and then we take a couple some more dummies. These dumb, dummies get a lot of use. They go from resuscitation dummies to being mass triage fatalities, okay? And again, we just practice, right? If you've met somebody in the field at a training exercise, when the real deal happens, right, you know that's the person you need to talk to. It creates a level playing field. And in emergency management, like in law enforcement, there are a lot of egos, okay? And uh, the man who ran the training exercises at Logan, he used to say, check your ego at the door. He'd say that right at the beginning of the exercise, okay? He was terrific. But he says, nobody's here for, you know, their own betterment. We're all here to work together. But he would start every training exercise with that. And it, the room was full of the, a lot of men, right? They needed to hear that. It was part of, part of breaking down the barriers and working together. So <clears throat> how do we respond to an incident? So we have all this training. We have these different mechanisms. But the real deal happens. 9-11 happened. Warwick happened. And the good news is a lot of these mechanisms were in place. So I want to talk a little bit about that and take you through some of that and some of the um, actual stuff. This is the emergency response pattern that is now standardized across the country. When an event happens, okay, it is the zone that it happens in is considered the hot zone. The warm zone is the in-between area between where it's happening and where the emergency services are being brought in. And the cold zone is where all of the emergency support services are located. This model is national and international, okay? And essentially, this is what we, we train on. Okay, so we all conform to incident command. We go through a hot, warm, cold phase, and there's interagency cooperation and coordination. Again, all theoretical, but also practical. Okay, now the reason for the hot, warm, cold is in the early days, like when we did the sarin gas, right, we were just beginning to deal with biohazards and, and what that might mean, and bi biological terrorism and what that might mean. So in the tabletop exercise that we did, the medical examiner, I was one of the medical examiner's team, we sent in the, all the vans to go pick up the fatalities, right? Well, we killed off all the techs, all the first responders, because sarin gas doesn't dissipate. So any of your emergency, we didn't know this, but we learned it as part of the, thank God it was a tabletop exercise. But my point being, we had to learn this. This was in the early days before there were hazmat teams and it was all organized how it was gonna be. So again, you set up a warm, hot, um, hot, warm, cold, so you can phase in and out. We also follow, basically there is a set procedure that we follow. Life-saving and recovery operations, we're going to triage the survivors, EMS, EMT, hospitals, and public health officials have all formed a consortium. In Boston, it's amazing what they've worked out because depending on who has the level one trauma centers <clears throat> and who's been drilling and working together, They've got it all worked out, so they're color-coded, they've geocoded the, the ambulances and the trucks so that when you ta put a tag on a person, there's also a tag on the back of the truck, right? And we've learned all this since 9-11, but they literally track the people and the tag and what hospital they go to so that this can come up in real time because that's one of the biggest problems is information and communication at these sites at the disaster sites, right? Everybody's so busy getting bodies into ambulances and trying to get them triaged that they lose track of them. So we don't know how many people we've got going to the hospital, right? So they've worked on some of this technology. Assessment, so then 
<coughs> a command post is established by the command, the incident command staff. They start to assess the scene and associate the damage to the persons and the property. It, they develop a plan to mitigate the incident, right? To work with the incident, recover the deceased individuals, and reestablish business, if you will, especially at an airport. You hate to be that cavalier about it, but even during the exercises, it was, we've got to get the runway open. We've got to get the runway open. We've got to get the runway open, right? And it's like, we have a disaster here. You know, we need to get the runway open. It's business. So you have to deal with all that. Initiate mapping, documentation, recovery, establish processing center for the deceased, and activate the Family Assistance Center. At this moment, because of all the legislation and all the work that's been done since 9-11, the Family Assistance Center is activated immediately, okay? When those planes hit the World Trade Center, within 24, actually it was less than that, it was in about 12 hours, there was a family assistance center in New York, but there was a family assistance center at Logan. Why? They left from Boston. Okay? There were a lot of people that were um, just sit stopped there that didn't originate there, right? But there were a lot of people that originated from Boston. They needed the support as well. Also, most of the crew was from Boston for both planes. The crew changed in Boston for both planes. So you need support for the staff of the airline. Everybody has a role, unlike television where everybody's role gets all mixed up and everybody's doing everybody else's job, right? The state police are in charge of perimeter per control. <coughs> They're also in charge of the legal investigation of the evidence, okay? And they're gonna work to map the material, but, and then the feds are gonna come in and they're gonna decide whether they have jurisdiction. But you have NTSB, you have the federal, you have FBI, you now have um, TSA, but then what's the other one that we have? Homeland Security, anyway, right? The bottom line is most of the local services, state and local police, are going to do the work. The other individuals may bring in teams, but they might not actually do any of the physical work. They're not the first responders. It always takes 24 to 48 hours for federal resources to get there. Those are the most critical moments at any scene. Okay, so. They're also going to help with the identification, especially when it has to do with the property or fingerprints, the legal identification processes. Okay. So this is where we kind of get down to the nitty gritty. This is where the specialists come in and start doing what they do on a regular basis <clears throat> and apply it. Now I put these slides in. We had during the grant uh, period, we had the Israeli identification section come and uh, exchange their method of identification with ours, with the medical examiner's office. And um, this is the military model. This model has existed probably as long as the military has, okay? And what's great about the, the federal system now is the federal system tends to reflect a, a military model, okay? It's very efficient. Okay, what do they do? They collect anti-mortem data. Okay, what's anti-mortem data? It's, it's the information that they collect on you as a soldier. Okay, they've got your dental x-rays. Okay, they've got a panorex. They have your DNA. They have your fingerprints. They have a facial photograph. They have identity tags and they take oral cavity photography. They do a full photographic photograph of your oral cavity, okay? Before you do anything, okay? This is intake information, okay? So let's reflect back on, you know, the mass fatality where the people were identifying, trying to identify the clothes of their, of their loved ones, right? The military basically sets the baseline 
for identification. So when post-mortem situations arise, they already have all the anti-mortem data that they need. Okay? So they're going to medically collect the data, dental, external description. So this is what's happening in the morgue, okay, for medical or military unidentified. They have circumstantial data. They're going to take a facial photo, fingerprints, DNA, right from the circumstance or the body. They're going <clears> to <throat> compare it all and essentially develop a hierarchy of identification. And this isn't any different than basically what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just more organized and systematized to work at a much higher level in terms of numbers. So essentially, if a personal acquaintance can identify the decedent, it immediately gets resolved, right? If that doesn't work, they can use fingerprint identification, dental DNA, right? Or if none of the biometrics work. So it's positive and negative. If these go negative, then they're going to keep going down the list. If they go positive, they'll resolve it. So it's a very efficient system, but it was important, at least for us, in terms of a learning environment, to sit down with them and see how different the medical, excuse me, the military model was than basically a civilian model. And this all happened pre-9-11. Okay. For us in this country, we're really dealing with medical examiner's offices. The medical examiner for that state has the responsibility of identifying individuals in a multiple fatality event. If the medical examiner chooses since 9-11 it is now an option that the medical examiner can ask for help immediately. There are federal teams in place, and they're under the National Disaster Medical System. It is a uniform service, okay? And we're intermitt intermittently federalized. In other words, I carry a federal ID, but I don't use it unless I'm deployed, okay? And the disaster mortuary operation teams is one of the teams within um, NDMS, okay? So I'm just going to talk about that, but there are more teams. If any of you are interested in this, there are quite a few others. There are hazmat teams. Um, there are teams that do all sorts of things, okay? So what's important is the whole process is really standardized now. We have the benefit of the hindsight that we, we gained from 9-11. So that even if, it, even if an area, a local area, wasn't on course as much as they, like Louisiana, we found out after the hurricane, wasn't really on track with their disaster management programs, okay? We found that out. Massachusetts has been much further along, okay? than many other states because we accepted some of the military model, right, some of the national model, right, and we, we got money to kick up our daily activities up to the level of a fatality event. Basically, you're going to set up a processing center. Why? The local morgue is going to be overwhelmed, right? As I said, we handle, or at the medical examiners, they handle between five and 20 cases a day, okay? They can have as many as 200 people in the cooler because they have a cooler that size. That's not the ideal situation, and they don't often operate at capacity. But they can't handle 1,000 or 2,000, okay? So there are services, and DMORG has a portable morgue where they come in. All the medical examiner has to do is, is call DMORT and say, I want federal resources. And within 24 hours, there is a portable morgue. Literally, they try to set it up in a hangar in an established building, okay? Or they can literally set up a temporary building and set up an entire processing area for the triage of human remains, okay? 
So intake, property, fingerprinting, autopsy, dental charting, x-ray, medical examiner and funeral directors, everybody's involved in the triage of the remains and the property. And basically everything can happen there. Catalog, sort, document, trace, photography, radiographs, fingerprints, dental, anthropology, DNA, autopsy, dissection, 3D capture, storage. Eventually, and this happened, this happened in New York. There was a temporary morgue set up behind the medical examiner's office. Okay? And that stayed set up for a full year. Right? Because the medical examiner's office still had to do all the cases, the day-to-day -day cases, the homicides, the, right, the suicides, the decomposed individuals, okay? But essentially, whether it's a portable morgue or your regular facility, the material is going to come in. If it needs to be stored while DNA analysis is being done, it's going to be stored, and then eventually, hopefully, it'll get returned to the families. That's the goal, along with a death certificate. So I have my little favorite mummy here, Otzi, again, to show you the power of 3D CAT scans. Okay, he's in his little CAT scan room, getting zapped. What's wonderful is, especially with the bio, biological hazards and suicide bombers having devices, we have x-ray equipment, and I'm sure you've all used it at the airports, right? Not used it personally, but had your <coughs> luggage intimately examined, right? And everything in it. I mean, there's really fine visibility in this equipment now. We also have, these aren't so portable, but we have lots of hospitals that can do 3D CAT scans, okay? We've used them for research for mummies. It's great stuff, okay? You can use them on bodies. And a lot of the agency agreements would allow for hospitals to essentially open their doors in a disaster situation, if necessary, to do virtutopsy. You can look at hundreds of people rapidly. And you can store it digitally. So technology has really come uh, very far. And it's going to be part of the standard operating procedure in terms of capture. Even if we use the old manual x-ray machine, right? And they have portable x-ray machines at, um, that are brought in as part of the morgue. Um, even if it's not the fancy 3D CT scan, we're still going to use this as a form of documentation. Why? Again, we're going to triage, we're going to analyze, we're going to identify, and we're going to release. You have to have that permanent record. This is a crime scene. These are homicides, okay? You need that documentation for who those people are. And this is some of the resolution. I've just thrown in some 3D CT scans. Um, they're just phenomenal. You can cut the body at any angle that you want, okay? Here I can evaluate the age of the individual by looking at the teeth, okay? This happens to be a mummy, but I essentially... Okay, you're looking at the mandible, and I said I want a full cross-section as if I just took an x-ray because I'm evaluating the root, root development of the third molars, which is complete. So this individual is plus 25 years of age, okay? I can also look at soft tissue, okay? It's amazing, and it can all be stored digitally, okay? I can look for foreign objects. Okay, I've got a bullet in the mastoid. Okay, you're looking at the base of a skull. I've got a bullet, right? <clears throat> I'm not expecting any of my um, multiple fatality victims to have bullets in their heads if this was a flood, right? Does anybody remember the Jimmy Jones massacre at Jonestown? Okay, does anybody remember what was unique about Jimmy Jones when they did the autopsy of him? He didn't drink the purple Kool-Aid. Had a gunshot wound, and it wasn't self-inflicted. <clears throat> they did a forensic examination of the leader of Jonestown, and he had no intention, apparently, of drinking that Kool-Aid. Somebody shot him.
So the roles are very clear. The medical examiner or DMORT, again, DMORT can supersede the ME. The ME can say, we can't handle this, please send in your teams. They'll send in pathologists, anthropologists, dentists, forensic nurses, EMTs, right? The whole host of individuals. They can assist with the recovery. They can do the medical exam investigation of the remains for cause and manner. And then they're going to work on identification. And then the goal is to release those individuals back to their loved ones. So the identification methods, again, we use them on a daily basis. They use them in the military. We're going to use them in mass fatality. We're going to start with a physical description, okay? We're going to examine the body or the medical examiner or whoever's at the triage, the station. And in a lot of the DMART situations, the anthropologist can be up there, the medical examiner, the dentist, right? We're all cross-trained and we're basically observing the body. I'm not, nobody's doing an autopsy at that point. So a lot of times intake is manned by many different medical specialists. You're doing a physical description. Does the person wear glasses? Do they have braces? Are they wearing earrings? Do they have multiple piercings? Do they have tattoos? They're looking at the remains and they're documenting as much as they can about that person, okay? Then we're going to, the first line of identification is we're gonna look for dental indicators and we're gonna to try to obtain dental records. One of the first things that we ask people in the anti-mortem interviews, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second, is who's their dentist and are the, are the x-rays available? We'll, we'll get them, but how recently did they go to the dentist? Okay, that's the first line of identification defense. That's what we use most often because most people have gone to the dentist, okay? Then we'll go to re medical record correspondence. Do they have any shrapnel in them? Do they have any appliances, pins, bolts, screws, keeping them together, okay? Do they have an accident where they broke a limb and have x-rays? We'll correspond that. We can also use fingerprints. Not many people are in the system, but there is a whole team, an evidence recovery team for the FBI that literally goes to houses during mass fatality incidences and tries to recover the fingerprints of individuals. If they're having a hard time identifying them, they'll go to the homes of the suspected decedent and you know go to their dresser and their personal items that they touch every day and they'll try to recover prints from those items and match them to the deceased individual. So there are whole teams that do that. And then eventually DNA matching. Okay, so this is an example of what an individual is going to look like, may have looked like. This is not someone from the station nightclub, but this is the effect of burning. Okay, and there's been some fragmentation. The hand is retracted in the pugilistic pose. There's been some loss of the extremities. But mostly you have the body intact. And you can see things about the person, OK? You can see um, that he was wearing glasses. You can see that it's a male, OK? You can see the hair, some of the hairstyle, not all of it, OK? You can see the ears. You can see the nose, OK? The differential burning is due to clothing, okay? It's not as burned as badly, all right? But this is the kind of material that the emergency responders that are in the processing center are dealing with. This isn't as bad as it gets. I didn't put the whole range in there, but this essentially gives you some idea of, from the station nightclub, this is pretty much what most of the remains look like, but in a multiple fatality air crash, you're going to have shearing forces and burning. But there are identifiable features on these individuals. This is what we're looking for, okay? This has the person's initials or the initials of their loved one. I'm not really sure with this person. Sometimes they do their own initials, sometimes they do somebody else's initials, okay? The Tasmanian, he's a popular, popular, uh, tattoo. Other people have appliances. Okay, broken hip. Can you see that? I know I'm going to trip over these wires here. These look like the screws that are holding my cabinet up in the laundry room. These are scary looking screws, okay? 
right? These are nautical screws, <clears throat> right? They didn't have a hip replacement, but the hip did collapse. The femur collapsed into the neck. And so it's being stabilized through the screws or the appliances, <clears throat> okay? Dental identification, we don't need the dental records per se if we can obtain a smiling photograph of the individual. In this case, this was a case that came through the office, this young child had never been to the dentist, but his smile is distinctive, okay? His teeth haven't fully dropped down yet, they're uneven, there's a diastema or a space in between, and here we've blown that up to do a correspondence. This is, this is an anti-mortem photograph. We will ask families for these photographs, okay? In addition to dental records, but you don't always get the dental records. They're not kept. It's not mandatory to keep dental records over 10 years. He also has a mole right above his lip, a small freckle or mole, okay? We can also see gross pathology in um, the skeletal remains. Okay, this individual suffered uh, severe fractures of both femurs um, after a car accident, okay? His femurs were pushed, snapped, pushed up into his hips, okay? They're well healed here, okay? Actually not very well healed because <clears throat> there was a rod in this one and when they removed the rod, they severed his sciatic. So he limped and he dragged his foot, okay? Poor man was uh, addicted to um, painkillers and eventually probably overdosed and his buddies dumped him out in the woods. This is a old, much older forensic case that I had. But this shows gross pathology. I don't have to have the medical x-ray. It would be nice if I did. But from a family history, I know, and from his medical record, I might not have the x-ray, but I have the medical record where both of the femurs were fractured and healed and severed. So that's what it looks like on x-ray, and I can still see the fracture line. So this is the kind of stuff, even at 9-11, with a small piece, this is going to break everywhere around this piece. You may have this piece preserved. Okay? Fracture sites tend to be extremely strong because the bone is remodeled around it. Okay? So it's going to break on either side of it, but that fracture site that's healed, it's not going to break. So you may actually get a fragment that's that big that you can then correspond to an anti-mortem x-ray. <clears throat> club foot in an adult. This individual suffered from club foot as a child. His, his feet are averted medially. Okay, I've put uh, two little straight lines in there and one is more averted than the other. But it, it still, he, was, he died when he was 65 years old. But I could still see the effect of clubfoot, okay? I had to consult with a radiologist. I had no idea that clubfoot would, you would be, still be able to see it. But again, using other specialists to extend your expertise. This is a typical anti-mortem, post-mortem radiograph comparison. This is the anti-mortem. There's a bladder. Um, catheter in there and we can see the detail okay what's interesting that if you look at the top dot and you look over there one spinous process in this individual is not straight it's tilted okay can you see that I'm not that tall but on the very top one all the rest are straight the spinous process which is down the back on the vertebra. They're all straight. One of them's tilted, it's just slightly tilted. It's a unique identifying characteristic, okay? There's also micromorphology similarity. And I mean micromorphology, the, the micromorphology within the x-ray is consistent, okay? How the bone looks, okay? And in, this was prepared for a courtroom in a, in a homicide case for an identification because we weren't able to obtain DNA for this individual, okay? We can do the exact same thing in 
disaster victims. DNA technology is probably the most, has had the most profound effect on identification um, of any technique. And as I said, things haven't really changed that much in the disaster landscape. We've just added new technology and, we, and hopefully we've learned from some of our mistakes. Some of the, the problems we face are that in a plane crash, for instance, um, the one off of um, Rhode Island, there weren't pieces and parts of the individuals that came up. The one that was off, um, was it Nantucket or it was off the coast of Rhode Island? I remember, I don't remember. Flight 800? I don't remember. This was the size of the human remains, fleshed, that came up. 5,000 pounds of flesh was pulled up with bone in it, okay? Sorting, all, just the labor intensive. When they tried to do a DNA because they were in a saltwater environment, it was very caustic, they had all sorts of issues with microorganism DNA on the material. Okay, it was, and it took them weeks to recover, right, off the ocean floor, those individuals. There was an extensive recovery uh, operation in the ocean. So DNA has its limits in terms of what it can do. In 9-11, at 9-11, at the World Trade Center, it became the platinum standard. It superseded dental identification. Why? Because we had such tiny fragments, tiny, tiny fragments of individuals. And so if we had a fingernail size piece of dental enamel, we could run that through DNA and get a profile. But that might be all that was represented of that person. All of it was tested. And as I said, they only came up with 1,400 people. So Again, dental we use in 80% of the cases, even in a disaster situation. Anthropological sorting and matching of the medical or the physical characteristics. And then in a normal case, DNA in a normal caseload is going to be about 5% of the cases. And what you can't see is what I just said since 9-11. Um, DNA has now Dental's the gold standard. DNA is now the platinum standard for identification. So now in most disasters, they run, they do the identification in a standard format, but they run the DNA as well. It's considered the platinum standard. And there's been federal monies put towards it. So simultaneous with all of this is What's happening to the families? I started out on that note, and I, I want to come back, and I want to talk about Warwick, Rhode Island, um, as we wrap this up. During the grant period, 98 to 2000, we implemented training for forensic nurses. And Barbara was a part of that. She was very instrumental through Fitchburg State to get the nurses accreditation for being trained at Logan during our training exercises that were a whole week for certain some people. We had a whole day of training. It was an eight-hour training for the nurses. And they came in and heard from all the different specialists that would be working on the identification effort during a mass fatality. And what we did is we showed them slides of all the different types of bodily remains. We showed them what we would be doing. And essentially what we were trying to prepare them for was to take the anti-mortem information from the families. There was, at this time, this was unique. No one had thought of this. This was, we, we kind of were at the cutting edge of this. And we trained 100 forensic nurses. There were three trainings over the course of a year, I believe, right? about that. And we set up a roster so that these nurses could be deployed to a disaster site in order to man or woman, case may be, the family assistance center and sit with the families and document everything about their loved one. It was about a six to eight page interview 
What were they wearing? Did they have jewelry? What's their eye color, their hair color, tattoos? Do they wear glasses? Do they smoke? Do they have any objects embedded in their bodies? All the personal information that the family could get. We also, on the interview, asked <clears throat> if there were medical or dental records that were available, if there were photographs available that we could access. Okay? And what we were trying to do was create an environment where the families were immediately, their needs were immediately met, A, in terms of getting information. Not only were they being asked to give information, they were getting updated. So there was a certain amount of coddling happening. The fr forensic nurses weren't working alone. They were working with mental health specialists. Okay? They were working with a lot of clergy who had volunteered for the Family Assistance Center, and then funeral directors, okay? Because the funeral directors are the ones who originally started DMORN. They're the ones who have done a lot of this foundational work, okay? And then also hooking them into grief counseling, and we had a whole section with the Department of Mental Health on grief counseling and emotional care services for the families, but more importantly, for the staff. We had, at this time, during the grant cycle, we had 30 mental health counselors that would come and work with the medical examiner staff on a regular basis, okay? They met us, right, the whole staff. They had a three-hour debriefing after they met us. They couldn't believe what we did on a day-to-day -day basis and had no mental health services, right? So we come to the station nightclub. So what I've done is I've showed you all the pieces, okay, that have been going on actually for the last 10 years, okay? So in 2003, the Station Nightclub tragedy happened. There were resources in place, okay? So I just want to just take you through that real briefly. But the OCME in Rhode Island, see, 2003, the federal mechanism had already been established. They immediately asked for DMORC to come in to do the identifications. Okay? The Rhode Island medical examiner, the, med the medical examiner in Massachusetts calls the Rhode Island medical examiner and says, what can we do? He goes, don't send anybody. I've got DMORC coming up. But do you have anybody that could help me get the information from the families? We said, we do. How it was just, you know, the synchronicity of all this was really quite wonderful. And we reached out for Barbara, the whole team, the call lists. A hundred nurses were basically deployed. I don't, 30, I think, eventually. It was more, 20. 20, okay, went down and sat with all the families with a team of individuals, so a clergy, mental health provider, funeral director, and obtained the anti-mortem interviews with all the families of those hundred individuals that were there, were deceased. The information that was obtained from the anti-mortem interview was corresponded to the decedents from the station nightclub by the DMORC teams. So they, they're capturing all the information and then they're comparing it. And there's literally a database now that you plug all the anti-mortem in information in. Those are automated databases now. You plug all that in, and they're plugging in all the post-mortem, and it's matching, okay? And it's giving you a list of possibles. And then the medical examiner, the anthropologist, or the dentist goes back and does a manual comparison. FAR, Forensic Archaeological Recovery, this other piece, is in Providence, Rhode Island. This is 2003. Dick Gould has already been training students. They've already been to 9-11. They've had a bunch of training exercises. The fire marshal's office calls them up and says, would you come and excavate the footprint of the nightclub? We're interested in finding the pyrotechnics, but also we're just interested because it burned to the ground, okay? All the people were removed to the medical examiner's office. They didn't think there was anything left. What they found were human remains at the doors because there was such a crush of people 
They also found a lot of personal property because the things that burned were the hands and the feet and jewelry. So far conducted through a proper chain of custody, they conducted a full excavation. They literally excavated the entire footprint of the club. Okay? All under chain of custody. They weren't allowed to talk to anybody. They're a volunteer organization. They're not law enforcement. They're not MEs. So they were there at the behest of the, of the um, fire marshal. And they transferred a huge amount of personal property. They had no idea they were going to find rings, necklaces. And in many cases, this is all the families had. It was huge. It was, it was such a huge part of the community recovering because along with the personal property, um, the bodies essentially, as they excavated them, they were able to reassociate some of the personal property with the location of where the person was, and then that group, then they had the families view the property, and then the property was claimed. And it, it was just an amazing effort, you know, and it really stayed quite local. I mean, the fed, feds did come in, but it really was a local effort in terms of the recovery and identification. In these situations, we have such an important role as emergency responders in terms of being sensitive and understanding what's going on to the individuals that it's happening, happening to. I mean, plane crashes have involved other individuals from other countries. We had to get translators in there. There weren't Americans on those planes, okay? And it's important, you know, the, the Family Assistance Act but that we're constantly reiterating that they're, yes, people have been lost, but they're the living victims. They're the people that are still coping and trying to deal with it. And we have, you know, we have the technology, we have the capacity, and we have to have the humanity to sort of put all of this together in a way as responders, scientists, practitioners were um, doing what we can um, to resolve the tragic events. I put up there the media and the internet. And I know probably a lot of you remember this. I remember Barbara Bush at, um, at the Family Assistance Center in New York, okay? The day, day after 9-11 happened. And she says, shut off your televisions. Don't let your children keep watching these images, right? If I saw the plane hit the building one more time, right, we were all traumatized by the media, right? The Internet's a blessing, right? We can be in touch with people halfway across the globe. It's also a bane, right? We're in each other's faces with this information overload, right? The Internet helps us. These, these databases are now computerized. Literally, we can send the family assistance centers get set up where the event happens, but we can access somebody in Arkansas and take the personal data over the phone and basically shoot it by internet. We don't even have to be there. With digital x-rays, the dentists don't have to be at the triage centers anymore. They shoot the digital x-rays over the internet and we can sit there and do, they can sit there and do an identification. Technology is a blessing. It's also a bane. I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword, especially in a multiple fatality event. We see this with victims of homicide, right? They're seduced, they're, they're, they're assaulted by the media. And the next day or the next week, it's not an interesting story to them. It, they moved on. You know, they leave empty shells behind, you know, and that's something that we have to be mindful of. And as emergency responders, we're much more mindful of that than many other people, especially the media. So part of uh, all of it is kind of staying focused with all the technology and all um, that happens in these events in terms of staying focused still at the community level. The government 
in terms of their national response system wants us to stay at the, the, at the lowest level first and then go bump up if we need to. And it's the same way with support within the community. Um, what we see in one of the women who worked at the station nightclub that works for FAR has now, as an anthropologist, continued to study the memorialization of the disaster site. I saw this when I worked at the medical examiners. I had many families go out to a death scene and memorialize it. Put up a windsock or put up a little cross. You see these on the highway now, right? It's all part of the healing process. There is, you know, closure is a dirty word to survivors and to victims of homicide, um, their, their families. But there is continuity. There is some closure. And people have to continue within their milieu. And it's really our part to contribute to that. Communication is extremely critical in that. And uh, the nurse's part in being with the families, getting that information to them. But also, they know what we see, and they're the intermediaries, right? They don't tell the families what their loved ones look like, but they translate the information so that they get the information that they need, and they protect them from having to, to go through that pain and horror. And, you know, it's really, it's, we've, we've come a, a long way. We still make mistakes. It's amazing every time there's a disaster, none of the communication systems ever work. The, the phones are the first thing to go, right? But the constant, um, um, the continuing effort to improve what we've done in the past and to build on that, um, you know, is essentially where, where it sits. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs>